Making an episode of a live-action show is a lot like baking a pie. To make a good one requires equal parts hard work, time, and love. If you succeed, you'll create something great to be enjoyed by everyone. But if you are missing even one of the key ingredients, you will fail, and it will burn. Leaving a lingering scent. My name is Pie Guy Rules, and I'm here at the bottom of the bakery to smell that pie. Metaphorically speaking, of course, in reality, I'm here to talk to you guys about an episode of a Schneider's Bakery show that was really not good. Hey guys, Pie Guy Rules here, and this is the second time on the bottom of the bakery, consecutively, that I've had to talk about a show that I've never spoken about on the bakery before. This show is hot off the presses. I watched this episode live, and it is, as of the time of making this, the only episode out so far. What this means is that the show may or may not change going forward, but everything Thing that I say in this video is explicitly talking about the pilot episode, just so everyone in the future is aware of that. Alright, on to the episode. Now, as with a lot of episodes that I cover here on the bottom of the bakery, this episode has a lot of little things that bother me, and a few major things. If I talked about all the little things here, we would be here forever, so I'm just going to focus on the big, major problems that makes this episode really, really annoying to watch. This thing is like a donut. Why? I'll explain later. This episode has a very major story issue. One very big, very glaring thing that is not here. Do you want to know what it is? Do you want to know what the show that is based on two girls creating a killer app that gets super popular is missing? It is missing literally the part where they make the app. We don't see them talk about design choices. We don't see them programming it. We don't see anything. And their game literally goes to number one in the app store in less than seven days. And we don't see any of it. Literally seconds after we find out that this thing's on the app store at all is when we find out that this thing has hit number one. There is zero progression. There is zero showing what what happened, there's nothing. The entire series is built on this and they skip it. This show expects you to buy that these two girls made nap and had it get to number one on the charts in less than a week without actually getting to see any of the progress. Look, in today's day and age, it's getting more and more possible for kids to have access to the tools needed to make games like this. Programming is getting simpler and there are more courses available to nurture talents like this. It's not really that unbelievable that kids could make something like this. Nor is it even that unbelievable that it could go up the charts so fast. Stuff like Flappy Bird and Angry Birds and Temple Run became successes pretty quickly. So even though the story isn't even one that would be impossible in the real world, I bet it's probably even happened. Not necessarily to number one, but I'm sure some kids have made some games that have gotten relatively popular on the App Store. But what's important to remember is that this is a story. And if you're going to put something out there like this, like make this great claim that these girls did this, you have to actually show them doing a part of it. I don't need to see every second of the girl coding the game, but maybe have them talk about some design choices. Maybe have them debate over what music they should use or something. But nope, literally nothing. The girls have the idea to make a game, and then the next thing we see is them showing it off. Oh, and speaking of not getting to see why they chose their music, why did they pick a rap song for their iPhone game? The plot is hinged on this, and yet it makes no sense to me. I've played the actual game that Nick is actually giving away for free, and while it does include a beat, it's not rap music in the game. You know why? Because that would be really stupid. What kind of mobile game features rap music, especially one that's like this that goes on continuously? You know, because the game keeps going, so it would have to loop and it would get really annoying really fast. Not only that, but the whole thing about them choosing a rap song is what gets them into trouble and what involves Kel and his son in the first place. It's a major component of the episode, and we don't know why the girls picked this song other than, eh, it was popular. The episode holds value to it. The whole second half is about the rapper guy chasing them down. You would think the episode would have given us at least a few seconds of them deciding to pick this song. When you write a story, you have to make the important moments seem important. You should not just gloss over them. And because I don't get to see even a single frame of them working on this game, I'm not really invested in them. I don't even know if the girls worked hard to make this game. I don't even know if the one girl did anything. I don't know how much each girl contributed. I don't know how long they spent making the game. I don't know why they decided to make the game the way it is. I don't know 
anything. Hey, considering they stole the rapper's music, for all I know, they could have stolen this game wholesale. Wouldn't that be a crazy season finale? The time that they should have shown the girls working on this would make us, the audience, want to root for them. It would make us see how hard workers they are, how creative they are. Heck, the girls don't even seem like they're that into gaming in the first place. The game that we see the one girl playing is literally a physical version of Simon. Show, don't tell. It's a very, very, very basic rule of visual storytelling. Oh, and it really bugs me that they hit number one on the App Store right away. Look, I understand overnight successes do happen, but in a story, I'd like to see some progress. When I was starting out as a content creator, and even now, it was always really exciting to see the numbers go up. Wouldn't it have been cool to have a montage of them climbing up the charts and seeing their reactions along the way? Or how about showing them get a little bit of success at first and then having to actually work for the rest of it by doing some advertising, by doing some promoting, by, I don't know, maybe making merchandise or something? Yes, they do go on a YouTube show, but that's only after their game has already hit number one. One. It's just like it's writing a perfect scenario for the characters. They don't have to overcome anything. Their success is just kind of dropped in their lap. Oh sure, their teacher fails them because he's a straw man that hates video games. Even though he assigned them the ridiculous task of make something that improves humanity and they actually managed to make a whole video game. But him failing them actually has no impact on anything after that scene. Before Kel comes in to get all mad at them because they stole his song, there isn't really much of a conflict. There's just a lot of them going going on YouTube shows and talking about how great it is to be them. At least in iCarly's pilot, it started them out with 37,000 views. And while, yeah, that's quite a lot of views for their first show, it's not something ridiculous like saying, oh, well, they automatically just got a million fans the first time they did this. Actually, this episode has a lot in common with iCarly's pilot, except that is way better. And I'll be talking about that, just, just not in this video series. There's another video series coming up that's, well, I'll just leave it as a little bit of a surprise. Anyway, point being, it would be nice if I was given a reason to feel like these characters deserve the success they got. And by adding one little scene, just showing them working on the game a little bit. And another scene, maybe just showing even a montage of a chart of them climbing up it instead of them just automatically being at the top. Those scenes would have gone a long way to making me care more about their situations and making the story as a whole not seem so forced. Alright, so the other big thing I wanted to talk about with this is the characters. It should come as no surprise to anyone who's been paying attention that most of the characters are the same archetypes as the characters on a lot of other Schneider's Bakery shows. You have the absurdly smart nerdy girl, like Quinn from Zoe 101. You have the tough abrasive girl who's the Sam as Sam. Er, the, the same as Sam. And, heck, Victoria's had one of those characters too, I think. And Charlotte from Henry Danger is also a little bit like that. There's also the man-child immature adult who acts nutty and does whatever he wants just like Captain Man from Henry Danger or Spencer from iCarly. And the most blatantly and frustratingly is the boy who has little bearing on the main theme of the show and exists to be weird and random just like Gibby and Jasper. Also Josh, but Josh was actually a main part of that show, so it didn't really fit with the metaphor here. Yeah, every main character except for one has an awful lot in common with other characters across the Schneiderverse. And the only reason the rapper's son isn't like any of the other characters is because I don't really know his personality yet. Most of his lines in this equate to him saying, gee dad, can I please go to New York? And look, I'm not saying that just because they've done the tough girl archetype before, they can't do it now. All I'm saying is that if you're going to have characters that are very similar to other shows that you've had in your production line on the same channel with the same style, you might want to give them an interesting twist, something about them that makes them unique from the characters before them. This character just seems like a less interesting, less mean version of Sam. Her name is Babe, which is a terrible name for a character unless she's promiscuous or a pig in the big city. So I guess I'll talk about Kel now. His name isn't Kel, his name is Double G, which may or may not be a reference to the gaming term GG, as in good game. I like Kel. 
I liked him in Keenan and Kel, and to be completely honest, he still seems to have a very similar set of acting chops, with some decently funny movements and line delivery. The guy does understand comedy, but the problem with his character in the episode is the fact that he's supposed to be the antagonist. He's supposed to be menacing these girls into getting them to give him his money, except he's not menacing. He's goofy. He's silly. He's just Kel. He looks like he's gonna smile after every single time he tries to say something intimidating. Also, if you know anything about the show, which you should know a lot thanks to Nick's advertising, you already know that they end up being partners with him, which kind of ruins the surprise. He does kind of work here as the crazy rapper, but to be completely honest, I think I would have preferred it if he had actually just literally played Kel from Keenan and Kel, who grew up and got a rap career. And I'm really kind of surprised they didn't do that. Also, in the show, he's supposed to be a super famous rapper, except for the fact that his hit song isn't really rap. Like, I'm no rap expert, but it's not really a rap. It's more of like a hip-hop song. There's more music. He's more singing than speaking lyrically. He gives a performance at the end of the episode. It literally ends with a big rap party. The sound mixing is really bad, so you can only hear the audience, and you can't really hear much of what he's actually singing or saying. But it definitely sounds more like hip-hop than rap. Anyway, let's move on to the last main character. Character. And the only one that I outright hate as opposed to the others who just seem like unclear characters. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you to Dumb Blonde Gibby. This kid is a part of the show because the tough girl thinks he's cute. That's literally it. That's the only reason he's attached. It's not like he particularly likes video games. It's not like he has anything to contribute or add. He's just there. I mean, at least Gibby on iCarly was involved in the fact that he would do weird things on iCarly. But this kid suffers like Jasper in that he feels like they threw in a weird kid just for the sake of having a weird kid, and this kid is the dumbest of all of the Gibby clones out there. We're talking Goomer levels where most of what he says are just random non sequiturs. And the laugh. <laughs> that laugh. The kid's a main stick aside from being stupid, is that he does that annoying laugh. You know when the last time I heard a laugh as annoying as that was? It was from a little show called Drake and Josh where Drake dated a girl who had an obnoxious laugh that she would do all the time. Drake called her out for being obnoxious about it and the entire episode is spent with him trying to break up with her. Why is it that the company understands that that's annoying and yet has that be the main character trait of one of the main characters? And look, I don't know if this is going to be his character trait for the rest of the series, but for these 40 minutes, it really grinds on the nerves. And it would be more okay if the character actually did something for the story, but he does literally nothing in this episode. Maybe his role is going to be their test dummy for when they want to test out things. In this episode, they do use him to test out motion capture for their phone game, but they never actually say that he's their test dummy. I mean, he's just eye candy for the one girl. So yeah, that's the cast. The biggest problem is that most of them are just undefined. And I know what you're thinking. Hey, Pie Guy, they're gonna develop and grow and you'll get more backstory on them and everything as the series goes on. I'm not gonna argue with you there. That might be true. But this is the pilot. This is what you use to sell the show. This is what they're using to introduce the audience to this show. And this thing was 40 minutes long. These characters should be very well established here. In the very first scene of this, we see Babe climb out the window after a squirrel. We see the smart girl ask a bunch of questions to the teacher, and we see dumb blonde Gibby saying dumb things and spinning his phone on his finger. There. That's a good start. That is a good way to introduce the characters, but you do need to go beyond that and give me reasons to care about the characters and understand what they will and won't do, what their goals are, what they like and don't like. I need more establishment than this. So yeah. There's the two big things. The characters aren't interesting, and they leave out major parts of the story. I wish I could tell you that I think Game Shakers is gonna get better, 
but the odds of this thing actually improving are incredibly low. Despite the fact that I think this show is terrible, you had better get used to seeing it. They cast some pretty young kids to be in it, which means they're expecting for this show to go for a lot of years. They made the mistake of having Sam and Cat be in their spinoff when the actresses were too old and already ready to move on. When they're going for this young of a cast, you just know that they're planning on milking this series for at least five or six years. And that terrifies me. What you're left with is a show that's about gaming and rapping, except for the fact that all of the gaming scene is just really shallow iPhone-esque games. And the rapping isn't even rapping. It's like these two elements did well with focus groups and the producers just decided to roll with it despite the fact that nobody on the team really understands gaming or rapping. <laughs> Whoa! Did you see that? That thing almost took off my head from whatever this is that I'm attached to here. What is this? Is it supposed to be some sort of plate or frisbee tin? Actually, frisbee tins are pie tins, so that wouldn't be very off base. Anyway, if you really want to know why this episode is like a donut, I'll tell you. It's because rather than actually focusing on making the core components necessary to make a good quality donut, Schneider's Bakery would rather just dance around sprinkling sprinkles everywhere. It's cool that they got Kel to be in the show. It's cool that there's a tie-in act. It's cool that they have a great set. But none of these things are anywhere near as important or vital as just telling a good story, having a good setup and a good payoff and a good fulfilling middle bit where the important parts are actually seen. And characters that are actually solid and well-defined and relatable and not just stereotypes that they've done a million times before. It's almost as if they would rather focus on anything but the actual story. And if that's the case, then maybe some of these people should just go back to making a sketch comedy show. All of this frivolous extra stuff might be enough to make some people happy with the show, but as for me, I can see right through it. Alright, now it's time for leftovers. Pro Jared's scene was pretty good. Although a lot of that was because I know his behind the scenes real life reaction to this episode, which you can actually see. He made a video talking about it and I'm linking it here. By the way, Jared, if for some reason you're watching this, if you ever wanted to get in contact with me, I would love to hear more behind the scenes stories of what it was like to work with the Schneider's Bakery team. Am I the only one that was reminded of that scene from the Nutty Professor with the Hercules, Hercules, when the kid was jumping up down on the trampoline saying, trampoline, trampoline. Pie Guy rules out. 